Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's enjoying the conference as much as I am. My name is Ramiro Gonzalez. I'm with the Center City Development and Operations Department with the City of San Antonio. Uh, we have the luxury and privilege of being tasked with the redevelopment and activation of downtown San Antonio. Um, and for <clears throat> everyone who calls this place their home, you know how great our, our downtown is. The fantastic assets that we have, the Alamo, the Riverwalk, uh, our fantastic cultural assets, our beautiful historic building stock, it makes it a fantastic place to visit. Our goal, our mission, is to make it a fantastic place to live, to make it a fantastic place to work, to, sp to spend time with your family downtown, not just for our visitors, which we're always happy to see, but we want to bring the residents back. We want to bring the locals back. And so we've made some great strides uh, in the past few years at that, at, uh, at that mission. Um, the challenge, though, which will be discussed in this segment, uh, is how do you make a place that is that livable, that walkable, and make it accessible to everyone? Make it a place that is affordable. Uh, too many times we find that it is a kind of either or scenario. It's either walkable uh, or it's affordable. And so I have the pleasure of uh, introducing today uh, a man who's, at, who's, who's figured it out. Uh, for over 20 years, uh, Robert Chapman here uh, has been developing exactly that kind of concept, uh, mostly in the southeast, eastern part of the United States and Arizona. Uh, he's the founder and managing director of Traditional Neighborhood Development Partners, uh, as well as a number of other enterprises that are focused on real estate uh, development and finance. Uh, he's also one of the uh, original signers of the uh, charter for the Congress of New Urbanism. Uh, still serves on the board today, as well as another of, uh, number of other boards uh, and commissions that are focused on the principles of new urbanism. Um, so with that, help me welcome Robert Chapman. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. It's really great to be in Texas, uh, really one of my very favorite places. I guess I've been here 15 or 20 times, but my ancestors are from Texas on both sides of the family. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, I went to the state capitol in Austin to research one of my ancestors who had served in the legislature. And uh, I wanted to know what, what he'd tried to do when he was there. And uh, they didn't have a lot of information, but they, they uh, showed me that he had introduced two acts or two bills. Uh, and the first bill that he introduced was that uh, workers in Texas uh, had to be paid in money. Um, meaning they had to get paid in money. <laughs> and so I don't know how else they were going to get paid, but I guess it could have been store credit at the mill or something like that. And the other law that he introduced was that um, uh, merchants uh, had to have scales that were accurate. Uh, and I went on and looked in the record, and both bills were uh, almost unanimously voted down. Uh, nobody voted for those in that day. I guess it was just too liberal. But being here today, I'm totally encouraged. You guys are t completely on the right path. I mean, uh, every, I've heard everything that I believe about new urbanism and smart growth and walkable urbanism. Uh, and uh, you've got the right information. It's really a matter of implementing it. Um, one of the first things I heard when I visited Texas the first time was um, if a Texan allows you to entertain them, you have a friend for life. Well, uh, it's going to be hard for me to entertain you more than what I'm doing now, and I think they were really talking about inviting you to a barbecue or uh, having the dinner or something. But if you ever get to North Carolina, uh, we're in Durham, and we'd love to see you. I, there's nothing I enjoy more than uh, touring people uh, in our town, which has really bounced back from um, Pretty, uh, well, I don't want to cr be critical of my own town, but it, it's very alive now, and it's, it, it is one of the hot places uh, to be, and it's fun to be working there. I reworked my uh, slideshow a little bit uh, in the last three hours because I was very impressed by the uh, first speaker who was talking about um, the bike, uh, bikeways and greenways in Seattle, uh, and I wanted to... Um, uh, uh, 
share a little of my belief and experience in that regard before I got into the hardcore development. Uh, and before that, even, I wanted to talk about something which we'll go ahead and put it up, which is called tactical urbanism, which is what can individuals do um, now uh, to begin the process of creating change. And tactical urbanism is short-term actions for long-term change, and they're applied to what William H. White described as the huge reservoir of space yet untapped by imagination. Imagination is really the limiting factor. And here's some great examples of tactical urbanism that have um, uh, happened around the country. These are all in a book uh, uh, which is uh, called Tactical Urbanism, by Island, uh, published by Island Press, uh, turning a shopping, uh, a parking lot into a uh, town square, uh, closing a city street. This is Herald Square in New York City, and, and uh, making it car free. Um, uh, the first effort at Build a Better Block in Dallas. Uh, and actually getting out at night, and you saw some other examples of this from Seattle, uh, with your uh, paint line marker and uh, fixing your street. Uh, paint's pretty cheap. Um, this all leads to something called the walkable city. And a friend of mine named Jeff Speck wrote a book called The, uh, the Walkable City. Uh, and he talks about the benefits of a walkable place. And I'm going to, if, you, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to really switch over and read something that I put together uh, about this. Uh, the economic uh, advantages of a walkable city uh, are described by Jeff by saying that many cities ask the same question. How can we attract new jobs, new residents, and entrepreneurial talent? And how can we keep our children from leaving? The answer of course, is to provide the sort of environment that these people want. Recent research clearly shows that the two largest generations in American history, the baby boomers, 51 to 69 years old, and the, and the millennials, 18 to 34 years old, have a growing and significant preference for walkable urban places where today the demand exceeds supply. Cities offering walkable urban places will be at an advantage by attracting millennials and baby boomers, boomers to live, work, walk, shop, play, and become citizens. Building walkable places is better for our economy. Epidemiological. I saw a display outside uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which has been running uh, a project for about the last 10 years. It's headquartered in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, called active living by design. And their, their mission as a company is to improve the health and health care of all Americans. And they think a huge part of that is the way we've built our cities. Um, quite simply, walking and walkable urban places are healthy for us, and suburban drive-only places are unhealthy for us. Evidence from the Center for D Disease Control and many other research gr groups is clear. More Americans than ever are obese. If the trend continues, the youngest generation of Americans will likely live shorter lives than their parents for the first time in our history. Living in walkable places is better for our health. Environmental. The carbon footprint per capita in walkable urban places is lowest, and in suburban and exurban places the highest, according to the EPA and other studies. Living in walkable places is better for our environment. When will ch people choose to walk? According to Jeff in Walkable City, um, only when the walk is, one, useful. What makes a walk useful? Ample housing, offices, shopping, entertainment, schools, churches, recreation, parking priced correctly, and other walkers. Two, safe. When crime sometimes is a concern, for most pedestrians, the bigger safety threat, excuse me, while crime is sometimes a concern, for most pedestrians, the bigger safety threat is motor vehicles, often speeding. The key to making a street feel safe is keeping cars, trucks, and buses at reasonable speeds and protecting pedestrians from them. 
This is achieved by meeting the following 10 criteria. One, a network of many small blocks. Two, the proper number of driving lanes. Lanes of proper width, 10 feet or less is safest. Avoiding one-way streets. Limited use of turn lanes. Avoiding swooping street geometries, including bike lanes. Parked cars between traffic and pedestrians. Continuous shade trees and replacing unnecessary signals with four-way stops or roundabouts. Three, comfortable. Pedestrians feel comfortable when there is a sense of enclosure created by the buildings on both sides of the street. Urbanists refer to it as an outdoor room. Ideally, buildings are at least as tall as the width of the space between them. This comfort is created by streets shaped by buildings, no exposed surface parking lots, parking behind the buildings along an alley, street trees, and rare curb cuts. Number four, interesting. There needs to be something interesting to look at for people to find walking rewarding and entertaining. How did you achieve this? Through windows and doors that open, retail storefronts displaying activity, no blank walls, no exposed parking garages, avoiding repetition, no single architectural solution should occupy more than 100 feet of sidewalk if possible. Here's another list. Uh, I collected this about 15 years ago from a traffic engineer named Rick Hall, who does a lot of the new urbanist projects around the country, starting with Seaside. And he presented this as a David Letterman top 10 list, but I'll just present them all at once. Uh, number 10 on the list is narrow streets, nine street trees, eight low traffic volume, seven sidewalks, which really surprises a lot of people. Most people would have put sidewalks first. But I think Rick has a good argument that the sidewalks are not the most important thing. More important would be interconnected streets, on-street parking, lower traffic speed, mixed land use, buildings, fronting streets, and the most important is small blocks. Uh, I know that's a problem for a lot of towns in Texas. I've seen some towns here where the blocks are 1,000 feet uh, or 2,000 feet on, on a side. I think they were designed so that everybody could have a full-size farm behind their house or something. Um, this is a study that you can download uh, from the, uh, uh, you can Google it. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting study that was done by Peter Swift, who's a new urbanist uh, traffic engineer out of um, Longmont, Colorado. He uh, analyzed 20,000 traffic accidents and correlated them to two other types of um, events. Uh, one was uh, the uh, number of injuries, uh, the, the relationship between the number of injuries and the widths of the street, and the other was the um, time saved by the fire department and emergency responders because their streets were wider. And what was determined uh, was that a 40 mile an hour street had twice the number of injury accidents as a 20 mile an hour street. That on a roadway with an average travel speed of 40 miles an hour, a reduction of two miles an hour, 5%, reduced, reduced crashes by 10%, serious injury crashes by 14%, and fatal crashes by 19%. Um, this is an even scarier chart, and this is something that was talked about by the first speaker, is what happens if you get hit by a car going 40 miles an hour. You have an 80% chance of dying. Uh, if it's 30 miles an hour, your, your odds are doubled that you won't die. And at 20 miles an hour, you've got a 95% chance of surviving. Um, one of the biggest uh, challenges I have as a developer, probably the biggest challenge I have as a developer, uh, is the International Fire Code. Um, according to the International Fire Code, there's no such thing as a street or an avenue or a boulevard or a lane or an alley. The only thing that exists is a fire equipment access road. And uh, all fire equipment access roads in the world must have 20 feet clear within the parking zone for fire trucks. 
Uh, this, this particular graphic shows that, in fact, you can get away just fine with uh, parking on both sides and 24 feet clear. And actually, if their lives were at stake, uh, I don't think anybody would have any problem with the fire truck putting its outriggers out and crushing those two, those two cars. But we can't build a 24-foot street, street. Our minimum is now 34 feet. And uh, we will have twice as many uh, f fatal crashes on a 34-foot wide street as we will on a 24-foot wide street, uh, based on all the research that we've seen. Um, the CNU has made it one of its main objectives this year to reform the fire code. And I know they've worked with the, the fire chief in San Antonio and gotten good results, uh, but a lot of the other fire chiefs uh, are not in any way interested in um, narrow streets. They want big, wide streets. And, and, and unfortunately, as the lady from Seattle was saying, they're the ones who have to go to the, often are the first responders to these terrible accidents that happen because of high speed. This is something, uh, real quick, I want to run through uh, road diets. Um, th these are some animations done by, my, by a friend of mine named Steve Price, uh, who shows what you can do to a really crummy old four lane or anywhere in the country uh, to turn it into a place and uh, make it safer for cars. And I'm just going to run through these uh, one at a time very quickly because they're, they're all animations of how you turn a high speed um, thoroughfare uh, into a boulevard or a street or a place that people want to be in. Um, this is the kind of thing that good zoning, good development regulations uh, makes possible and even causes. And later on I'll show you some examples of where it's been a causative. But these are all street diet programs uh, where you, you're turning uh, four laners into two laners or three laners, adding bike lanes, adding transit um, uh, across the country. Uh, and you end up with a place that's more delightful uh, and safer and more desirable and the real estate is more valuable. Uh, and people want to be there instead of fleeing to go somewhere else. So, I mentioned CNU. Uh, uh, I'm on the board of the Congress for the New Urbanism. We had our annual Congress this year in Dallas, uh, and uh, th next year or this, this spring it's going to be in Detroit. Um, I highly, highly recommend that everyone here uh, log on to cnu.org uh, as soon as you can. Look at the new website. I've, I've taken some screenshots from the new website, uh, but it, ha it is a wealth of information. And the thing that CNU has going for it is that it really is the only national organization um, that involves all the disciplines. The, the point of CNU is the common good. Unfortunately, to some extent, the point of the AIA is to uh, promote the architectural and profession and protect it. Certainly, the, the point of the ULI is to help developers make more money. Uh, the engineers groups are to promote the interest of the engineers. Uh, the APA, the Planning Association, which many of you are involved with, uh, is uh, fo focused on its profession. But CNU includes members of all these professions. It's got about uh, nearly 2,000 members now, and typically between 1,500 and 2,000 come to the annual Congress. Uh, and I very much invite you to come. The picture there is of a project that I was involved with uh, in North Carolina. Um, my partner, uh, Bob Isner, was the developer uh, called Southside, and it is an amazing turnabout. It was a, um, abandoned vacant land near a, w a railway switching yard uh, and it has now not only become desirable and affordable, to my knowledge it's the most racially integrated community, new community ever built in, in America. It's uh, right at the same demographic as Guilford County, North Carolina, which is 50-50 um, between white and African American and other minorities. Um, 
So these are from the CNU website. Please look at it. Now to the main thing we came to talk about, which is uh, being a developer. Uh, here are the things I've been involved with. Uh, we built a new neighborhood for Duke University. Um, it was affordable. Uh, we sold houses for $99 a square foot and $101 a square foot in a, in a $140 a square foot market. Uh, there were no limits on the uh, resale appreciation of those houses, and so those houses are now worth $300 or $250 a square foot because we didn't have enough. We only were able to build 65 units. Uh, people go there. It's right next to Duke's East Campus, and they say, well, I went where I, you asked me to go, and I got there, and there weren't any new houses. And that really made me feel great because that was our whole goal. I have a theory which nobody else in the world, I think, agrees with, but I think it's true, which is good architecture is free. Uh, putting the window in the wrong place costs exactly the same amount as putting it in the right place. Uh, it's about balance and harmony and proportion. Uh, having uh, uh, a bad detail on a house uses the same amount of material as a good detail. So it's a knowledge-based development. This is a project we did out in Arkansas for a small college called Hendricks uh, College in Conway, Arkansas. They wanted to have a college town next to their campus, uh, and um, we were able to talk the uh, state of Arkansas into building the first two roundabouts on a U.S. highway that they'd ever done. Now there are hundreds of roundabouts in Arkansas. They've gone roundabout nuts out there. Um, the, one of the things on this picture uh, at the lower roundabout was to get from the campus to the gym. Um, the mayor insisted that we have a tunnel. Generally, I'm, I hate tunnels because they generally are scary and they generally smell bad and people just don't like being in them. But I was out in Denver for the CNU that was in Denver a few years ago and saw, three, uh, saw a tunnel uh, w that an artist named Christopher Janney had created an experience called the Harmonic Passage. And we hired Christopher Janney to come in and with sound and light create a uh, puzzle that you can solve by pushing buttons. Uh, and so far, 124 people in the last eight years have solved the puzzle. Uh, it has something to do with a nearly extinct woodpecker in Arkansas. I don't know the exact answer to the question. But um, anyway, our project uh, made the front page of the New York Times um, above the fold. Uh, those are student dorms. Uh, uh, those are, but downstairs we have a Panera Bread and a really great pizza place and a bank and a bookstore. Uh, one of the challenges was to hide a super Walmart that was on the edge of the property and restore a creek. And we were lucky enough to get Southwestern Energy from Houston to put their regional headquarters here, build a building which ultimately the college will own, and then have them restore what was going to be, according to the original engineering plan, an L.A. river, a 100-foot-wide concrete-lined ditch. We turned it back into um, uh, a, a wetland with, na with native species, and it has two classrooms in the wetland. Uh, good detailing, reclaimed wood from the, um, uh, reclaimed cypress from the bottom of the Arkansas River, native stone, recycled brick, um, Houses where you can stand on the sidewalk and speak with somebody sitting on their front porch. Uh, this is something we did in Durham. Uh, it's now called the Innovation District. The uh, first building has been built. This is one in Chapel Hill, which uh, is called Winmore, and we had the only uh, low-income housing tax credit financed uh, apartments in a high-end neighborhood ever done. We had 100 apartments right inside the development. You can't tell which ones are the um, low income or the affordable units. Um, the, um, we also had uh, about 60 units which are small houses, that, which was, the town had the idea that that was their contribution to affordability was to require a certain number of houses that were 1,000 square feet or less. And that turned out to be uh, very popular. I, had a, I have a friend who lives there and I said, what do the people who bought the expensive houses there think about living in the neighborhood with the people who are occupying the, the uh, low-income housing tax credit units? 
And he said, well, you know, Bob, we call them neighbors. And so that was a pretty good answer as far as I was concerned. Uh, this is a project I did in Florida. It was all affordable, 100% uh, affordable to every, people making below 60% of income, uh, which was made possible by uh, being able to issue tax-exempt bonds. Uh, our first phase, which was the phase I did, was 434 units. We set the all-time record for the Orlando area with 65 move-ins a month. Uh, and we had a high, we had a 90% retention rate at the end of the first year in a market which typically had to replace every tenant every 11 months. And so it was about a better house for less money in a better location. These, this is some student housing out in um, Arkansas at a university called Harding. Uh, and this is the project I mentioned in, Chap in uh, Greensboro uh, called Southside. Uh, those are live-work units where you can um, have, a, have your own business in, in the apartment. You can live on the upper two floors. You can live on all three floors and not have a business. Or you can live on the top floor and rent the second floor, whatever you want. We call them a flex house. Um, it's a very good idea except for people who uh, want a business that depends on uh, walk-in traffic because uh, they're typically in the core of a neighborhood and you don't have the volume of traffic uh, to support uh, restaurants, but it's great if you have an insurance company or an advertising agency. And for some reason, they, they end up being incredibly popular with hair salons. I haven't figured that out, but uh, this is a new project we're doing in, in um, downtown Greensboro uh, called uh, Union Square at South Elm. Uh, this is a master plan uh, that we did for Duke University for 120 acres between their two campuses. Duke um, has a west campus, which is, uh, when I was at school there, was all men, and an east campus, which was used to be all women. They've now, um, they're now fully co-ed, but the in-between was an old mill village, uh, and gradually they put some very substandard student housing there and a few other leftover odds and ends. And so our idea was to build a whole new city town there. Uh, this is something Duke has asked us to do recently, which is to do a pocket neighborhood on their campus. Uh, th this is designed by Ross Chapin out of um, Whidbey Island, uh, Washington. Uh, and Ross talks about something called the scale of sociability, which is uh, 12 to 15 units facing a common green, uh, which is all about neighborliness. Uh, and walkability. Uh, this, this, this is the most fun thing that we've been involved with lately, is uh, buying old properties in downtown Durham uh, that are, um, were, well, when we got started, they were all abandoned. Now we can't afford to buy them anymore. But <laughs> this was a little Sinclair station. Uh, it became a coffee shop uh, called Coco Cinnamon, which Somewhere that ranks coffee shops. I don't know who, who it is, but they were ranked the eighth best coffee shop in America by the coffee shop ranking website. And uh, anyway, it's a great thing. Rain or shine, people are there. Um, across the street was another gas station. This was a Gulf station. Uh, this was uh, recently uh, listed in Southern Living Magazine as one of the 10 coolest places in the South. I guarantee you that nobody who ever went here ever looked at Southern Living Magazine, but uh, anyway, they wanted to be affiliated with this place. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, uh, it started out as a 7-Up uh, um, bottling company, and it's become Full Steam Brewery, which has started a brewery avalanche in our town. Uh, they were the first. We now have, I think, six or seven. Uh, and, and we just got our first two distilleries, one of which is in our neighborhood here. Um, we're trying to counteract that. Here's another bar. Uh, this is a, a music hall in an old um, Chrysler Plymouth, in an old uh, Lincoln Mercury dealership uh, called Motorco. Oh, a uh, 1930s hot dog stand was revived and reopened. Um, and people love it. 
this is a building that we have that um, is used for events and we try to counteract all these distilleries and bars and um, breweries in the neighborhood by uh, having a very successful CrossFit gym. And so people can stand around drinking, watching the people running up and down the streets. <laughs> anyway, uh, yoga, a uh, pottery uh, uh, kiln and display store, a legitimate theater, um, which does mostly new plays that are never, they're usually premieres and a pretty amazing place. Uh, a re recording studio and guitar sh sale shop. And the thing that got this all started was um, my wife, who is in the back, uh, started a charter school and um, most of the parents were very leery of coming to this part of Durham. But having those 300, or t initially was 150 parents a day come in to, uh, to pick up their kids and drop off their kids created traffic which helped the first restaurant get started, and once that happened, it, it, it just took off. Um, this is a group that I'm a member of called the National Town Builders Association. There are about 40 developers. Uh, we have a couple of people uh, from Texas in it, and we travel all over the country visiting other projects. Uh, I took these pictures uh, a year and a half ago in Chattanooga, uh, we, uh, our fall round table. Uh, and this was a master plan that a company called Dover Coal and Associates did in down in um, on the west side or east side. My Chattanooga geography is not very good. Uh, away from the river, uh, and uh, they they brought out the master plan, and then we walked around and saw that everything on the master plan had been built in about a 12-year period. Just an amazing turnaround. Uh, in fact, that's Victor Dover right there. Uh, who had not come back uh, to Chattanooga since the charrette, uh, and he was blown away. And the most important thing, the thing they wanted more than all, was a down a uh, neighborhood grocery store, and that had just opened the day we were there, um, Enzo's Market, uh, and it was uh, focused on fresh food uh, and locally sourced produce and locally sourced um, healthy food. Uh, but these are some of the first units there. These are some other ones, all, all different architectural styles, very cool restaurants. Uh, this was up in Louisville, just a couple of pictures uh, in a part of Louisville called Nulu. Uh, and uh, we, our group was meeting with the developer there, and we saw this sign that said, before I die, and our group said, before I die, I want to build towns. So I know that was one of our guys who wrote that. And the other one, uh, said, before I die, I want to finish Midtown Bryant, Arkansas, which is uh, a new urbanist development there. Um, they were uh, into the gas station thing, just like we are, uh, and this, this was a pizza place in an old gas station, and they had one of the oddest things I've ever seen in front of it, which was two cars that were hooked up to hydraulic jacks that were involved in a head-on collision at the rate of one millimeter per day or hour or something. So after three or four years, these things were going to be completely crushed into two cubes. Uh, but you could sort of hear them creak a little bit as you watch this. Um, this is a sort of an interesting idea. This is down in Atlanta, um, a two million square foot warehouse um, uh, called Ponce Center, now called Ponce City Market. Uh, Sears and Roebuck built this warehouse, and they wanted to convert it into a uh, neat place. And the very first thing that was done in the process, which I thought was amazing, was to build a community living room in a screen house, no air conditioning, just, just fans, with free Wi-Fi and really good coffee. Uh, and the, the neighborhood completely adopted this Ponce Center project. Uh, that's a model of Ponce City Center when it's completed, and the little corner in the lower left is where we showed a picture. And it got, it's done. Um, I don't particularly like the style of it. My, I've got a, a friend who's an architect, and he said, well, they did a really great job of uh, post-apocalyptic grunge. Uh, they're getting the highest rent in all of Atlanta. So anyway. Um, why, I, I'm switching gears now. Uh, this is something that's meaningful to me as a developer, 
which is why is it so hard to raise money for walkable urbanism? And Chris Leinberger came up with an analysis a number of years ago that there are, there are 19 standard real estate products. I hate for people to think of real estate products. It really, you really ought to think about places people live or pay, places people love or places people want to be. But Chris said 17 of them are fundamentally sprawl producing. And these are the, these are the standard real estate products. Offices build a suit, industrial build a suit, industrial speculative warehouse with 20 foot, eight foot clear span, uh, hotel, limited service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I put in yellow the ones that are not fundamentally sprawl producing, which would be high density infill apartments. Um, and then miscellaneous <laughs> urban entertainment centers. Uh, those didn't really go over, but nothing else is eligible for pension fund or REIT investment. And that's one of the reasons we have to have a fine grain organic approach to walkable urbanism. This is a neat uh, chart. Uh, it's a total rethinking of um, the planning world, which used to be focused entirely on use, use-based zoning. This is the transect, which is based on, um, on, on uh, compatibility context, uh, things uh, being harmonious and working together within these uh, transect zones. Uh, here's some examples of very low scale walkable urbanism that had been done by my friends in the new urbanist movement, ION in South Carolina. Uh, this one is, um, I have forgotten, I think this is Baldwin Park in Orlando. Uh, this is more of ION. Uh, this is um, Habersham in Beaufort, South Carolina. This is uh, Vickery uh, in Cumming, Georgia. More of Vickery. Uh, Vickery. This is Hale uh, Village in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, this is um, Burkdale uh, in um, uh, uh, Cornelius, North Carolina. Now, Leading from that, um, let me just uh, let me just stop for a second and focus on affordable. Uh, there are three ways. I'll, I'll go. I'll go to the next next picture. How how do we create affordable development? I think there are just three or four things that need to be done. One is we need to reduce the cost of entitlements. We need to make it possible. Uh, in California, the impact fees alone add $400 a month to the cost of a house, $40,000 impact fees. That translates into $400 in either, certainly it does in rent, and, it, and you can say that it does in uh, mortgage payment. Um, the, point, the point is create affordable housing by building more housing. Pretty simple. Um, the second thing uh, is to reduce land cost. Is, um, and sometimes zoning uh, has unintended consequences. Uh, the city of Durham, where I live, just upzoned the entire downtown core to no height limit. You can build a, I don't know, what's the tallest building in the world? You, you can build that now there. Um, Guess what the person who owns that lot now thinks their lot is worth? It's no longer uh, a four-story walkable urbanism uh, op uh, opportunity because they're thinking, well, I could put a 30-story building on this, on this land. So it, it's, it's a, a, a tricky uh, process. And, probably, and the, the third and most, uh, uh, and also very significant, is reducing the cost of financing. We shouldn't... Um, be using uh, expensive money to build long-term affordable assets. We should be using inexpensive money. And when the government can borrow money for less than 2%, the government could credit enhance loans for 2%, which would cut the price of occupancy by a couple of hundred dollars a month on a typical uh, rental unit or a typical house. So, 
If you had no cost land by use, turning, let's say, a city surface parking lot into affordable housing, that would reduce your cost of production, uh, uh, of, of construction, or, or of delivery by $20,000 in our town, where a pad for a um, multifamily unit is now worth $20,000. I don't know what it is here. I'm guessing it's probably 10. It's more of a, nor more of a normal number. Um, so that would reduce your, your monthly rent by $100. If you could get lower cost financing, uh, you could knock another $100, $150, off of it. Uh, and then use uh, intelligent appro approaches to design uh, and make it possible for people to walk and not need cars and not need structured parking. I think just by tweaking the system, you can deliver house houses and places to live for three or four hundred dollars a month less cost. And if you look at what that would do in terms of percentage allocated to housing costs, plus if you put it in the center of the town where people could walk or take Uber, um, I have uh, two employees now who don't own cars. They just, they use Uber for everything, uh, and bicycles, and walking. Um, so if you, if you uh, did those things, uh, you could solve a lot of the affordable housing problems without resorting to complicated things like low-income housing tax credits, which seem to me to be better at creating billionaires than they are at really creating quality housing. And there probably are eight or nine or 10 billionaires in America now who got it all from that program, which is basically free money from the government. Um, so if you learn how to do it, why not take it, I guess is their idea. More power to them, I guess. But I think it could be much more efficient if we had low, income, low interest rate lo direct loans that got repaid. Okay, these are some more t examples of what could be done in places like places that we were shown pictures of this morning that are right here in San Antonio. <coughs> it starts with the road diet. It starts with uh, a quality form-based code uh, zoning program that uh, makes it of right to do, the, to do good things and hard to do bad things. Um, so I'm just going to scroll through all of these pictures because it's the same message in each one, which is that none of this is rocket science. It's all about figuring out what kind of places you really enjoy being in and taking a tape measure and copying them and then uh, doing the same thing in the place that you're working with. Uh, this is the Berkeley Unified School District Transportation Yard. Uh, this is their other transportation yard, turning these from bus parking lots where they had to put 10 foot high chain link fences around them, which is not very friendly place to be, into a place that people love being. Uh, in, in a town that's ter terribly constrained for affordable housing. Um, this, is, uh, this is one I really like. This, this actually happened. Uh, if you've been to Miami lately, uh, it, um, it's called Wynwood. Uh, and all of these uh, one and two story uh, warehouses uh, have become very cool art galleries and restaurants and hip places. Um, now here's, here's a, a real place um, in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina called Johnny Dodds Boulevard. The city there adopted a form-based code and a completely new zoning um, set of requirements and uh, this is what they were shown would end up happening, and it is already happening. Uh, in the very far distance, you might see the new uh, bridge over to Charleston. Um, and in fact, I'll get to my last picture here. That's the same street. Uh, I took that picture a year and a half ago after that form-based code was uh, created, uh, and they've uh, achieved what they set out to do. So it's a matter of knowing what you want and making it easy for people to do the right thing. That's my presentation. I'd like to go to um, questions at this point, if any.
I read an article recently in The Economist that said instead of taxing improvements as much, we should tax land to keep people from sort of hoarding it in the cities? Um, that's a, um, an idea that's been around a long time. And uh, as far as I know, there's only, there is one city in America that does it that way, uh, which is Pittsburgh. Uh, and there are very good results. Um, it it uh, has a lot of benefits because it uh, does not discourage people from developing. It encourages people to develop. And it discourages keeping beautiful, great locations uh, as vacant uh, surface parking lots. Uh, and Pittsburgh is totally sold on it. Uh, there is a, an institute in Cambridge, Mass. that promotes that. I'll think of, uh, there's a philosopher, maybe somebody here knows his name, who came up with this idea. Um, anyway, I'll think of it in just a minute. But it's, it, the idea has been around about 150 years, and it, we all could just talk to Pittsburgh and see why they think it's such a good idea. Any, anything else? Sir. You mentioned, I think it was Winmore. Yes. Uh, with, that had the low-income housing tax credit component. Can you talk a little bit about what drove the inclusion of those apartments within the larger master plan? Was it mandated? Was it a business decision? No. Um, Winmore uh, was developed under a, uh, it's, I, I said Chapel Hill, and it's in the Chapel Hill mail post office zone. It's actually within the uh, jurisdiction of Carborough, North Carolina, which is a little town that touches uh, Chapel Hill. And they had adopted a, an ordinance which was wonderful called the Village Mixed Use Ordinance. And it was based on a book written by a man named Randall Arendt uh, called Crossroads uh, Village City, uh, Town City, or something like that. And it, it talked about placemaking, and it was, it was wonderful. And uh, we thought, well, this is what we want to do. Uh, and we were the first people that ever followed that ordinance, and it turns out nobody else has done it since, because it took about three years to get it approved. Right next door to us, somebody went to their surveyor and said, I'd like you to draw a plan that will be approved of right immediately. And before we even started the first houses there, the other developer was, was under construction and made us feel like we must be really stupid. But, we were trying to do the right thing, and so we proposed as part of the village mixed-use plan that we should have inclusionary housing. It was not a requirement. We sold the property to a large developer from Charlotte named Crosland, uh, and then they went to the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency and got the allocation for the 100 units of uh, low-income housing tax credit. They followed our architectural code, which would ha had become law as part of that village mixed-use ordinance. It, uh, the, in fact, our architectural code, people Google it, and, and, and I get phone calls from people asking me questions about interpreting things, <laughs> which, you know, sort of funny. But um, it was a voluntary uh, thing because we believed that we could do it and we could make it work, and we did. Um, I personally think the whole problem is um, trying to make people do the right thing rather than um, encouraging and re rewarding for doing the right thing. Uh, and I think all, most of our thousand page zoning codes are based on the idea that you would do something totally awful unless we forced you not to. And there are some people out there, in fact, probably everybody in America was in the former, was in that group up until about 19, we always use the date, 49, uh, when all these zoning codes and so forth took real firm hold. I guess they'd go back to the 20s. So uh, I think it really ought to be a matter of um, making it easier to do the right thing rather than preventing people, trying to prevent people from doing the wrong thing, because then you just get avoidance behavior and you get the lowest common denominator, you know. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned Randall Arendt, so I'm assuming you might be familiar with um, conservation developments? Yes. And I was just wondering if you'd ever done one where you had um, an enormous amount of land and you kind of uh, did high concentration 
in a portion of the property and then left the rest in a natural state and then put it into conservation easements? We, we have planned uh, three projects in North Carolina that would um, be conservation developments. Um, and lucky for me, um, uh, all three of them came to the point of being ready to go in 2008. And we did not pull the trigger because we would have been bankrupt uh, just because the whole country fell off the cliff. But one was a thousand acre farm down in Edenton, North Carolina, and another was a thousand acre farm in um, Pender County, North Carolina. And the, the idea was, it's sort of a perverse system because what you have to do is you have to get it zoned for all of the units. So we had to get the, we had to get the um, thousand acres zoned for 6,000 units of housing, and then we had to agree not to build on half of it, which gave us a tax, which would have given the landowners, it did not happen because of the crash of the economy, it would have given the landowners a tax deduction up to 40% of their adjusted gross income for the value of those 3,000 units that were not built. And so it's sort of a game kind of thing that you, I wish it weren't, I wish it weren't so uh, tied up in that. Uh, there, uh, the conservation fund is a big, uh, big part of that in, in big parts of the West, uh, and I know they've done great work. Um, but sometimes it doesn't, it, it's, it's more tax motivated than other things. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Someone mentioned earlier uh, the importance of educating um, people about the benefits of living close to where you work. And I wondered, and I may just be ignorant on this point, but I wondered if that same type of education was occurring in the financial um, industry or when we talk about financing of homes. So you mentioned governmental monies and you know being able to knock a couple of hundred dollars off so is that something that is occurring now or are there plans or where are we headed in that direction i think that's a great question because i think that's the weakest link i don't think that the um banking industry or the uh real estate investment trust industry or the pension funds or the college endowments uh, of america have have got have a clue uh, about the importance of making um, investments that have long-term compounding benefit for the country. Uh, and uh, I was actually involved in a group called the TND Fund, and we we called on CalPERS and we called on big pension funds, and when it came right down to it they were only interested in uh, internal rate of return. And if you know how an internal rate of return works, it's based on compound discounting. You sort of reverse compound discount and see what percentage of interest you could have paid if you paid all your money out in interest. And um, the way that compound interest discounting works is nothing that lasts longer than about seven years has any value. And that's, that's the problem, it doesn't work with them. I got my cue uh, that the one minute was over. Thank you very, very much.